ancient city of Delhi are almost overwhelming for someone coming from the West. Exotic and totally foreign, they reflect a culture that has one foot in the past and the other solidly planted in the future. With poverty on one side, India has one of the fastest growing economies on the other. India is poised to lead the world into the future. Just why is an important part of the untold story of India's scientific and technological contributions. Contributions that have been decisive in shaping the present. To look at one of the most astounding feats of India's past, I travelled to Jaipur, some 300 miles south of Delhi. Jaipur is famous for its legendary pink palace, but I was looking for a scientific treasure of magnificent scale. Here in Jaipur, the Hindu belief spurred an innovation of unprecedented precision. Much like in the modern Western world, the movements of the sun, the planets and the stars were believed to affect human life. In order to determine the most auspicious times for important events, like festivals or marriages, precision was crucial. Astrology, a pseudoscience claiming divination by the positions of the planets, the sun and the moon, gave rise to one of India's oldest and most important sciences, astronomy. I'd heard and read about the Janta Manta, but nothing quite prepared me for this unique sight. The Janta Manta is one of five observatories built by Maharaja Jai Singh more than 300 years ago. What looks like a giant playground is in fact an architectural and astronomical marvel. Unlike the small metal tools the Europeans developed to read the stars, some of the 16 astronomical instruments built here out of stone, mortar and plaster are the biggest in the world. Prior to Jai Singh's time, astronomers relied on smaller instruments such as the astrolabe. The immense forms that Jai Singh built here and elsewhere in India are the only ones of their kind. Why is it that an instrument like this is so big? Resident astronomer Dr. S. Bhattacharya explained the importance of scale. ...and the large number of markings you can have on the circumference and really small angles you can measure through. And is that true of all of the instruments? They're all so big because that makes them all more accurate? Yes, exactly. The measurements can be really accurate. So the bigger it is, the greater the precision? Yes, exactly. The larger there's a circumference, then the smaller angular measures you can mark on these dials. Mm -hmm. At Janta Manta, the ancients could track the movement and position of the celestial bodies with a higher level of accuracy than anyone before them. Believe it or not, the object behind me is a sundial. It's not one of those cute little circular ones you see. It is in fact the largest sundial in the world. This equinoctial sundial is called Samrat Yantra, which translates to supreme instrument. It is just under 75 feet high and Jai Singh's most important creation. And these steps run 164 feet along the gnomon, the structure that creates the angle of the sundial. Jai Singh oriented the structure to the north. On an east-west line, he positioned the axis of a hemisphere to create two quadrants. Using geometry, he calculated the angle of the ramp at 27 degrees, equivalent to the latitude of Jaipur. So the ramp points exactly to the celestial north pole. The shadow from the ramp falls onto the quadrant showing the local time, accurate to within seconds. So can you tell me how accurate is this sundial? Well, that's it. Dr. S. Bhattacharya, the assistant director of the nearby Birla Planetarium, explained Samrat Yantra's accuracy. Well, it measures smallest measure of time is two seconds. Each of these is two seconds? Smallest ones are two seconds. But there are problems, of course, because sun is not a point pinpoint source. It, the difference between the shadow and the light is not obvious. Okay. Your error can be more than two seconds. But still, that's pretty, pretty accurate. Pretty accurate. Every hour this ancient Indian innovation was used around the world for hundreds of years. Jai Singh's Samrat Yantra was astonishing 
in that equinoxes and solstices could be determined down to the second. Both of these celestial events are rather important to astronomical or astrological systems around the world. But he didn't create something out of nothing. Jai Singh's designs capitalized on a dimension of science and technology with much older roots in India's history, mathematics. It all started with a dream. According to Hindu tradition, the world began from nothing when it was dreamed by Brahma, the creator god of India. Brahma's waking and sleeping pattern was believed to govern vast cycles of history. So vast indeed, that a single Brahma day lasted one kalpa, that is 4.32 billion years. Almost the same time span modern geologists estimate to be the age of planet Earth. Ancient Hindu chants and writings contain calculations of these Brahma cycles, outlining Indian mathematical works back to the 4th century BC. Interestingly, the ancients used words to express numbers. The word arms was used as the number two, since humans have two arms. But words didn't lend themselves for calculations, so around 10 BC, they were replaced by symbols. Prior to the Indians, the Babylonians had two symbols. This symbol signified 1, 60, and 3,600, and this symbol signified 10. Obviously, with only two symbols, the applications were limited. To write six, it took six symbols. Even in the Roman system, it took two symbols. In the Indian system, however, it took only one symbol. For more convenience and accuracy, the ancient Hindu language, Sanskrit, replaced word numbers with nine single digits. It is the Indian system of nine digits that we use today. Traders and merchants were looking for an easy way to count and calculate. So commerce became the motor for ancient Indian mathematics and a numeric system that invented this crucial digit. It's the last symbol of this ingenious system for which we remain forever indebted to the ancient Indian thinkers. Zero. For them, the symbol stood for the Sanskrit word shunya, meaning nothing. But once the concept became a symbol, mathematical computation was born. Just like Brahma's dream, from nothing came everything. The impact of India's long history with the zero can be felt across our high-tech world. No zero, no binary system, no computers. Without the concept of zero, modern mathematicians and physicists would all be out of a job. All of this, the computers, the software, would be impossible without the preeminent ancient Indian invention, one that's been called the equal of any single human achievement, right up there with mastering fire or the invention of the wheel, the invention of the concept of zero. Numbers have become so much a part of our daily lives that we forget where they came from. And if you ask most people about the origin of our numbers, they'll probably say they were Arabic, and that would be wrong. It's not difficult to see how this mistake occurred. Arab traders introduced the 10-digit system to the West around 900 AD. But even in their own records, Arab scholars refer to the Indian system. In all likelihood, the Arabs picked up the Indian way of counting in a marketplace much like this one. It was a time when knowledge was bartered and traded like a commodity. When merchants from China or Arabia traveled to India for treasures found nowhere else, like spices, gems, and a special metal with far-reaching impact. In search of the first advanced material in the ancient world, I traveled north to the foot of the Himalaya mountains to find clues to the legendary Wootz steel.
From the dawn of their civilization, the Indians wisely utilized what the land provided, devising methods to shape nature to meet their needs. India's history of metalworking is documented in some of the oldest written records in the world. It is legendary. Yet only a few tantalizing clues to the source of that legend remain. Here, along the road to the Himalayas, I'd heard there were groups of itinerant workers who still retained one of the main skills of the ancient Indian metal craft. The Gadulia Lohars are blacksmiths whose smelting traditions reach back more than 3,000 years. Watching them hand forge simple tools carried me back in time. I could easily imagine how the ancients smelted and forged their iron. Their methods seem to have changed very little. Iron ore from deposits across India was placed in a mud and brick furnace charged with charcoal. Bellows provided an air supply that brought the temperature up to 1100 degrees Celsius. The molten iron or bloom collected and cooled at the bottom. In order to make a tool or a weapon, the ancients reheated and hammered the bloom into shape, much like these lohars do with bars of scrap iron. After a few whacks with the hammer, I came to appreciate the blacksmith's skills. And what's more, I realized that while the ancestors of these lohars forged everyday tools that contributed to India's wealth, it wasn't sickles but swords that brought the world to India's shores. When in the 11th century AD, European crusaders felt the effect of Islamic swords in battle, their war stories launched the legend of the Damascus blade. One blow from the sword they said could cleave a European helmet without turning its edge, or slice just as easily through a floating silk scarf. Though the swords were forged in Damascus, the capital of modern Syria, the steel and the technology came from India. Europeans took thousands of these fabled blades home, determined to uncover their secret. Yet, the formula remained a mystery for centuries. Besides smelting, I looked for another clue in my search for the fabled wood steel. To learn more, I travelled north to the foot of the Himalaya mountains. Following in the footsteps of ancient traders, for whom no distance was too far to get their hands on the fabled woods, I was in good company. Even Alexander the Great had sought this ancient Indian treasure. Today at Windless Steel Company in the town of Dehradun, they're making replicas of the Damascus blade. Now, of course, they use modern tools, but the basic approach remains the same. Forging, shaping and polishing constitute the major steps in creating a blade. Still, the big question remains, whether the modern replicas retain more than just the look of the legendary steel. One legend would have us believe that to give the sword its finishing touch, the metal was cooled by thrusting it through the body of a muscular slave to have his strength flow into the sword. And that's not the only outrageous tale. Others believe that the strength of Damascene steel came from quenching the sword in the urine of a red-headed boy or in a goat that had eaten ferns for three days, neither of which got them very far. In the centuries after the Crusades, many sought to replicate the swords of Damascus, but most achieved only the appearance not the property 